Welcome everyone to a, another episode of Fred and John Talks. Uh, you may have already noticed a big difference in the uh, layout. I'm not wearing a baseball hat and I uh, for every episode, 40 some odd episodes we've had, I've worn my baseball hat, but today is different. Today we have a special guest. He is both a, a personal friend of mine and he's a colleague in the mental health field. Dr. Andrew White, we welcome you. Thank you so much. And we thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And we are very excited. We're going to talk about, Dr. Andy is going to talk about, well, I, affectionately, I call him Dr. Andy, but his name is Dr. White, Dr. Andy, <laughs> Andrew White. Um, and before we begin, um, he wrote a wonderful book. Now, I, as our listening audience knows, I've been a therapist 32 years. And he wrote a wonderful book called Mending a Broken Mind. John, and John is our camera t cameraman today. Can you see that? Looks good. Maybe a little closer. Yes, a bit. That's better. Mending a Broken how to, Mind. How to Mend a Broken Mind by Dr. Andrew White. You can see it well? Yes. Okay. So um, you can get that on Amazon. Uh uh, I, I, of course, read it from cover to cover. And before I hand it over to Dr. Andy, um, you know, uh, I told you this off camera, but, um, you know, you quote me in the book without mentioning my name <laughs> because some years ago, I don't even know how many years have passed now, you and your lovely wife, Fanny, uh, used to host a, a depression support group once a month on Sundays. And um, I, I attended it because I've suffered. I shared with the listening audience my own mental health history. Uh, and one day I said at one of the sessions, I said, I'm not depressed. I'm lonely. <laughs> and you quote me in there yeah, about, but, you know, with keeping my confidentiality and my anonymity. But I don't mind telling the people. So we're going to start by opening up with the question, the two part question. Um, Andy, um, can you tell us, uh, in the, you do the interview in two parts and tell us about your background, uh, your medical background, uh, uh, your career background, and you also have a very significant personal story to tell. So Thank take you. it away. I'm so thankful to be here. You know, being transparent is something that I'm committed to because I really believe that more people who find out that depression is common and treatable, uh, the better the mental health of this country will be. I, um, I do have, I am a family physician, but for the last two and a half years, I've practiced exclusively mental health care. And that's partly because of my personal background, which I'll share later. Um, I have, uh, a degree, uh, a medical degree from many years ago and a family medicine degree. Uh, among the things that I've done professionally, I've been in private practice and I've also been a residency director for a uh, family medicine residency in this area. So uh, practicing mental health care and teaching it has been just a part of who I am forever. Um, another thing that qualifies me to talk on this topic is because of my own personal story. I've experienced so many depressions and have learned from them. But, I, you know, I'm not the only one in my family who's had depression. All five of my siblings and all four of my children have had depression. So I've learned not only about depression uh, from my own personal story, uh, but also from the family history. And, um, you know, since I've been really focusing on mental health care uh, for the last two and a half years, I've just been reading profusely up on this to make sure that I'm rendering the best care I possibly can. Uh, so if you'd like, I'd be happy to tell my story. 
we sure would like to to our listening audience to hear it. Of course, I know the story, but uh, I'd love to hear you tell it in more detail and from beginning to end. Great. So I think I experienced my first depression when I was 11 years old. I was a missionary kid in Africa, and I was sent away to a boarding school. And I know that boarding schools are very good for some people, but it didn't help me. I became what I think was depressed because I remember many, many weeks, maybe months, where after school I would climb into the attic of the family that was supporting me. I just cried till I couldn't cry anymore. And one of the, I don't think my parents really realized how desperate I was. And, and my mother actually wrote something that she thought was funny, uh, but my sister doesn't think is funny at all, which she said, I once wrote a letter asking for a picture because I couldn't remember what my family's faces looked like. So what I sensed as a desperate need uh, was not recognized. Whether that was or was not a depression or whether it was just severe homesickness, I definitely experienced a depression at 16. We had recently moved away in this country after coming back from Africa. We had recently moved away from a place where I really found myself. I had friends. Um, I enjoyed what I was doing. But because my father had uh, his second heart attack, we had to move so he could have a job that would be less uh, intense. But for me, it was one of the first times that I really felt a place for me. And so leaving was very stressful. And I just so happened before I left to meet with a friend who gave me some hashish, which as you know, is very potent marijuana. And while I was in my new home, I took that hashish and I immediately had a severe panic attack, just completely overwhelmed with fear, uh, trembling, shortness of breath, chest pain, the whole thing. And that triggered a depression. And because it had been a drug that I precipitated it, I didn't share it with anyone. So for six months, I lived with those feelings completely alone. And fortunately, they did go away after six months, but they were a very troubling time. The um, next depression was actually my severest. I was in medical school. And the first two years of medical school are very intense. And towards the end of the second year, I started to slowly get depressed, which I didn't recognize as depression. And once again, near right at the end of my second year, I had a panic attack that pre precipitated a pre depression that was so severe that I had to withdraw from medical school for a year. And at that time, there were a limited number of drugs that could be used for depression, and they didn't work on me. Uh, I was hospitalized because I had suicidal thoughts, and they thought they had helped me, but when they released me, I was so depressed, so hopeless, uh, so helpless, that I actually did try taking my life with medication. And after that, I was admitted to the psychiatric facility after three days in the ICU into the psychiatric facility, and they decided to do electroconvulsive therapy, what's commonly called electric shock therapy. And literally on the fourth shock, I was radically improved. And that was the beginning of my complete recovery. 
and I was able to go back to um, medical school. Okay. Then, at the end of medical school, I had an internship, and internships are notoriously difficult. They may be the most difficult time in a doctor's training. And at the very beginning of that, I suffered from a depression. But fortunately, this time, I got in touch with the doctor immediately who gave me medicines, and I was able to continue in that. So I was very thankful for that, and I actually ended up enjoying my internship. In my second year of residency, which comes after internship, I uh, was part of a team that was brought together to go over to Cambodia during the Cambodian uh, during the Cambodian crisis, where Pol Pot, who is known, uh, well known as a leader of genocide, um, had um, had this country in its grips, and they think in the end, two million people were killed by that organization. But I went over to help with a group of people. And when I stepped off the plane in Thailand, I had another panic attack. And I was just back into depression. And I couldn't understand things because I felt it was so clear that God wanted me to be there. I had actually... Just before going there, I had actually um, been at church one day, and they talked about the Cambodian crisis, and we prayed about it. And on the way home, I told my wife, I wish there was something I could do, but there's nothing I can do because I'm in residency. The very next day, in my mailbox, was a letter from the dean of the medical school saying that the uh, Southern Baptist Church was paying for a six weeks mission to Cambodia and we would get residency credit for it. So for me to experience depression after getting such a clear call was just devastating to me. But while I was there, I, um, we were, our group was at a free Khmer ranch, uh, a free Khmer, Khmer refugee ranch. place. Yeah. And, and they're the good guys. But this call came for a refugee camp of the Khmer Rouge. They're the bad guys. Okay. And no one wanted to volunteer. And I knew as a physician with uh, interest in mental health care, I knew the worst thing I could do for myself was to break myself away from that group. But I felt so strongly that God was calling me to do that, that I went there. And while I was severely depressed there, I spent two weeks on a malaria ward. And while I was depressed, a revival broke out. And by the, on that ward, and by the end of the revival, there were two to 3,000 Cameroons who had accepted Christ as their Savior. Wow. Amazing. There was a chaplain there. He was a Methodist minister who had served in Cambodia and had very little fruit. But what I would do is when I went by to see my patients after taking care of them mentally, uh, medically, I would share them the gospel. And all I said, all I said to each person is, do you know that you have sinned and you want to be forgiven? When I would come back the next day, 
half of the people had smiles on their face. They couldn't wait to hear more. So they went to this uh, minister and he shared the gospel with them and uh, they were transformed. Also in that ward, there was a, um, there was one of the Khmer Rouge leaders, one of the really wicked people who had found Christ. And he would stand up in the ward and read from the book of John, which had been translated by the Methodist minister. And that was a very dangerous thing to do because the Khmer Rouge leaders otherwise told the people that if you become a Christian, you will sleep on the ground. And what that was a euphemism for, you will dig your own grave. Yeah. And then the, third, the fourth person who was involved in this revival, he was a man who would go out into the camp and hold home churches. But it was such a dangerous thing that he would come back at night just shaking with fear and anxiety. And I'd have to give him a shot of Valium so that he could calm down. So here, four weak people involved in a revival that brought the grace of God to two to three thousand people. What a As story. I'm so I'm so glad I asked you to tell a story again because I said at the beginning, oh I know your story, but I didn't know all these details. <laughs> I'm transfixed. <laughs> Can imagine how the audience is feeling. But well, please continue. Yeah. So um I did well uh, for a number of years when I started a new job as a um, residency director of a program that I started. I had a depression, but that was handled well with a reducing job responsibilities for a short time and medication. At that time, before that time, nobody knew that you should continue to treat depression. If someone got better, you don't stop their medicine. You continue it because with after you've had the fir your first depression, you have a 50% chance of a second one. If you've been with your third depression, you have a 90% chance. So why stop medicines that have no side effects and make you better but they didn't know that at that time right my very last depression was 10 years ago and that was uh it what had happened was a number of years before that i had left the residency program to go into private practice and that change was stressful enough to begin the process. So um, I, I um, actually got so depressed that I had to take a year and a half off from, from my work. But fortunately, after that time, God restored me. Um, there, this is another amazing story. Um, I got, at, while I was about a year or a year and a quarter into my last depression, I developed metastatic kidney cancer. It was in my kidney and in the lymph nodes in my abdomen and in the lymph nodes in my chest. And when I found out about that, I was thrilled. I thought, I no longer have to suffer depression. I can die and go back home. Well, my family was unwilling to pray for my death. <laughs> what they did pray for that would, was that God would heal both my metastatic kidney cancer and my depression. But if God was not willing to heal my depression, then he wouldn't take me home through cancer. The 
The day before my surgery for cancer, I had a second MRI. It showed all the lymph nodes were normal. Well, it's a miracle. No treatment. Miracle. No treatment. Mir miracle. Uh, uh, answer, answer, miraculous answer to prayer. Absolutely. And with the, um, with the uh, surgery, the night before my surgery, the doctor gave me a small dose of a medicine to help me sleep. And when I woke up, I, for the first time, sensed a bit of hope. I actually had noticed a small decrease in my depression. Well, the surgery, they removed the kidney cancer. They removed the lymph nodes, which were all normal on pathology. And that medicine was used by my psychiatrist, gradually increasing it till I was completely normal and go back to work. So God actually answered the prayer that my family had been praying. You God got, healed you got, me. You got some real prayer warriors in your life, don't you? That's what prayer warriors is about. God healed the, virtually the same day that I was cured from cancer, I started to get over my depression. And when I did, I said to myself, God, Miracles are not common. Why me? And when I asked that question, I felt God was saying, you need to tell your story and you need to be involved in mental health care. So that's where I am today. Oh my gosh. Andy, that is some story. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, about um, where you are today, um, what your practice is yeah, like. Yeah, so first of all, one thing I wanted to, I, I started, I was in private practice recently, but six months ago, I started with um, a, a community health center. These are partially fun, federally funded because it's for poor people. Mm. And um, one of the things, by the way, I found out about poor people is how traumatic their lives have been, often in early childhood, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, going hungry. Yeah. Uh, it's no wonder that they're poor. I mean, they just hardly had the chance to get started. And it's no wonder they have mental health problems. Yeah, yeah. So... I've been in that organization for six months, but I'll tell you, for the first three months, I experienced severe anxiety. I've had anxiety before with depression, but I've never had it just anxiety. And I found out how terrible that could be, too. Welcome to my world. <laughs> um. We were talking uh, off camera before we started about um, different drugs, and one of them was ketamine. Can you say? Yes. What's amazing today, I think when, when I went to medical school, I really wanted to be a family physician. But if I went to medical school today, I would go into psychiatry because there's so much psychiatry has to offer for both depression and anxiety. PTSD, ADHD, whatever the mental illness is, there's so much that there is to offer. And some of the people who are listening in may have gone already to get treatment for depression and it just didn't work. There's really a marvelously new um, treatment for depression called ketamine. It is somewhat controversial because it can be used as a drug of addiction, but it's been around for many years as an anesthetic. But what they found is some of the people who they used it on as an anesthetic also got over their depression. And it's it, serendipity. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And what a coincidence. But 
what is so amazing about this drug, and if you have tried getting help for depression before, if you've tried to get help and it just hasn't been there, go to your doctor now again. There's so much more, including ketamine. With, with ketamine, literally the first dose, some people come out of deep depression. And people who at the beginning of the treatment were actively suicidal are no longer suicidal. That's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Um, and, you know, but there are, there are so many new drugs, too, yeah. that are helpful with very few side effects. No long-term side effects, sometimes short-term, like a little more anxiety than usual or a little difficulty sleeping or a little nausea. But the medicines that I use the most, probably 98% of my medicines that I use are have no long-term side effects. And the, um, the side effects that you just mentioned that people sometimes have, are they transitory? Do they Trans go away? They're absolutely, they're okay. transitory, usually the first week and a half. And I tell people when I give them the drug, I said, it's your body getting yep. used to something. Yep. It's not the it's a not long term problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but ketamine's a great drug. And I do also, for the people that are most severely depressed and have not responded to medicine, ECT is a real option. I've had ECT three times in my life. And while I did have some memory loss around the time of the treatment, my long-term memory is good. Mm -hmm. There are a very few percent of people that will have some long-term memory problems, mm -hmm. but mostly it it can be a lifesaver. And if you're if you're severely depressed and you've tried everything, please consider ECT. It may be the difference between life and death because you're so hopeless. And the ECT, just to remind our audience, was the electroconvulsive therapy. Exactly. And electroconvulsive therapy is not like what you saw in One Flew Over the yeah. Cuckoo's Nest. Right. You're put to sleep. You're completely unconscious. Your body is temporarily paralyzed. They do a brief seizure of the brain, often just unilateral now with less side effects. And... um. With that, uh, with that treatment, people often really improve without any side effects at all. My brother, who was severely depressed just six months ago after being treated with multiple medicines, including me involved in his care, just wasn't getting better. And he had it, and he's back active as a cardiothoracic surgeon in Africa. After getting ECT. After the ECT. Oh right away, he didn't have any long-term side conduct. Well, Dr. Andy, um, I think as we wind down, I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of John and myself, our, our YouTube channel, Fred and John Talks. Um, it was just a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being transparent uh, as we were talking off film, um, we, we we have to keep breaking down the stigmas of mental illness. Yes, you know, know. there are people in in the public eye, celebrities, musicians, you know, uh, uh, pro athletes who, uh, uh, you know, the good news is I've been reading more and more that they are coming forth and talking about their mm -hmm. mental health problems. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we want to say once again, thank you. John is reminding me once again to end where we started. Dr. Andy has written a marvelous book. Can you see it, John? Yeah. Is he going to mention any uh, thing about the book? We've got plenty of time if you want to do it's it. It's How to Mend a Broken Mind by Dr. Andrew White. You can get it on Amazon.com. Do uh, you feel the need to say anything about the book or shall we close? Just briefly. There's a number of books out there now for depression. 
what's unique about my book is it's specifically aimed for the Christian. Not that okay. only Christians have depression. Right. But often in the other books, the spiritual aspect of depression is not mentioned or yes. dealt with. Yes. And this book looks at the medical aspect, the counseling aspect, and the Christian spiritual aspects. Even if you're not a Christian, there's a lot you can learn from this book. Right. But if you are a Christian, um, I think it will be especially helpful to you. Yes. I'm glad, um, I'm glad you, you mentioned that uh, because I know as a therapist that, you know, for decades, psycholo the psychology profession has been hostile to the faith. And I'm a Christian therapist, and I can't tell you how many times I've gotten new clients who've come to me and said, you know, uh, I've been looking for a Christian therapist for months, if not years. Um, uh, I, I interviewed a therapist and I asked them if they were Christian. They said yes. And then I went to see them, but they didn't, they didn't bring any of their Christian faith yeah. into it, you know? Um, but, uh, I, you know, if, if I ever do get to write a book and it's a pipe dream of mine, <laughs> I'm not fully retired yet. And you got, and as you know, writing, it takes a lot of time. Uh, I'd like to write a book about, um, you know, therapy, uh, Christian therapy. Yeah, yeah. Including, well, including the spiritual, treating the whole person, including the spiritual. And I want to make a point of saying that psychiatrists and psychologists should work together. Yes. Sometimes you just need the therapist. Sometimes you just need the psychiatrist. But if you have a significant medical illness, you should take advantage of both counseling and medication. And that is why at the very beginning, I called you friend and colleague because we <laughs> refer patients to each other. Absolutely. Andy, thank you so, so much. And God bless you. My pleasure. May God continue to bless the work that you do because it's marvelous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And tune in again next time.